Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here, again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of JS Box Corel harmonizations. Today we're looking at Hail, Straf mich nicht in deinem Sohn, which translates to Not in anger, mighty god. Um, very active corral, a couple of interesting harmonic quirks in this one, but we're just going to hop right into the analysis. It's pretty straightforward. Um, no key signature. We start on A minor, we end on A major. I reckon the overall tonality of this corral is A minor. We move to A, E, A, and C, which is another A minor chord, no need to reanalyze. And then we get our first interesting chord. We have E, that same E, that same A, and B. So this A is a 4-3 suspension over the bass, but notice that it resolves not to G sharp, but to G natural. So this is in fact implying a minor dominant with this little passing seventh here as well. Um, so it's pretty cool that we see another minor dominant. Uh, I say another in the context of the fact that we saw one recently, and they're relatively rare. So it's cool that we're seeing one again in such close, um, uh, like I said, proximity to another chorale that we've analyzed. But afterwards we have F, C, uh, F, and A, which is our sixth chord, F major, passing seventh in the bass. And then we have D, D, uh, that same F and that same A again, which is a four chord. We're going to see this six to four progression again later on. It helped me with an analysis or some chords that were um, being analyzed um, in the latter part of the chorale. Another passing seventh in the bass before we get B, D, F, and uh, G. You know what, actually before we move forward, I think at this point we've actually modulated to the key of D minor because this phrase ends in a half cadence in the key of D minor. So I'm going to say that this D minor chord here is the point on which we modulate because we start to see C sharps on the next beat. We have this C natural here, it takes us down to B, and then we get a passing C sharp here. So this chord that we have is B, D, F, and G. This B natural makes the chord major uh, in terms of its uh, triadic quality. So this is a G7 over B. And this is not a secondary dominant or uh, the subtonic seventh of A. This is actually harmonization of the melodic minor scale because this B to C sharp to D portion here is just D melodic minor. And typically when we see a 4-6-5 chord, it's usually followed by some type of dominant, usually a 5-6-5 chord. Also commonly we find a 7 chord somewhere in close proximity to it, but we get a 5-6-5 chord here. We have C sharp, we have A, we have uh, E, and we have that same G being held over. So 5-6-5 five, five as a subdivided progression, and that leads us to D minor, D, A, E, and F, this 9-8 suspension over the bass. Also, um, we, we see a lot of 9-8 suspensions over tonic triads in general in box music, or in his chorales at least, um, but we also see them a lot over D minor chords especially, which is kind of interesting. And here we see a D minor chord where it's happening in a cadential context, uh, and then we cadence on A major, A, A, C sharp, and E, which is our dominant in the key of D minor. Okay, our next phrase takes us back to the key of A minor. We end in a perfect authentic cadence, and there are no modulations. I think also with uh, C, C sharp versus C natural, this is a direct modulation where we start the phrase on A minor over C, which is 1, 6, C, A, uh, E, and that same E from before. And we're just going to stay in A minor for the rest of the phrase. We have C natural, we have A, we have D, and we have F sharp. This is a melodic minor here, A minor, so we know that this D major chord isn't like a secondary dominant or anything, or this F sharp isn't like a leading tone to anything. It's just the raised sixth scale degree. And that would make this D7 over C, which is a 4 4 2. We would expect this to resolve to a 7 6 chord. And Interestingly, even though all the supporting voices are very active, um, it does that. D is a chord tone, C is a chord tone, E is a little brief passing tone here, and then we resolve to B, D, F natural, interesting cross relation here, and G sharp, which is G sharp fully diminished seventh over B, seven, six, five. Also kind of implying like an E dominant a little bit here with the G sharp kind of in passing, but I think ultimately 7 sort of covers the analysis because I feel like that's where the 4-2 chord uh, wants to resolve. Um, but E is a non-chord tone, C is a non-chord tone, this 
E is also a non-chord tone. This B is the it's the only chord tone that's part of the original chord that I analyzed. And we would expect this to resolve to some type of tonic triad, which it does. C, C, um, E, and A. A minor over C, 1, 6. Passing tone in the bass, passing tone in the tenor, and a pair of passing tones here in the alto, with this A being held over. It's almost like we're implying a passing 7 chord, but with this A held over in the, in the melody, it's hard to fully analyze the chord, but we know that it's sort of happening with the supporting voices. Uh, but then we get A, E, A, and C, which is just taking our chord and putting it in first inversion. This C as well briefly takes our chord and put it puts it back in first inversion. I reckon it's because we're approaching that D there and Bach didn't have a lot of time to, uh, to uh, use two passing tones, I guess, even though he's been using 16th notes pretty liberally in this chorale so far. Um, but afterwards we have uh, D, F, A, and B. It's B minor 7 flat 5 over D, 2, 6, 5. Um, B is a chord tone, D is a chord tone. We would expect this to go to a 5 chord. It's very common in Bach, E, B, G sharp, and B. E major in root position, that's a 5 chord. E is a chord tone. D is a little passing 7th, so I'll mark that there. And then we go to A minor. A, C, uh, E, and A, tonic triad in root position. Okay, moving ahead to the B section, we have a phrase that ends with an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of A minor, but we get there through E minor. I'm going to analyze this as a common chord modulation, where this A minor chord is also the 4 of E minor. The more I listen to it, the more it sort of sounds like a plego progression linking the phrases together. But if you analyze it as a direct modulation, just to E minor here because it's its own separate idea, that's fine. The main thing for me that separates direct modulations is either because there's no common chord between the keys that are... Um, I guess being progressed from one to the other, or if there is a uh, um, cross relation in the voices, like here, for example, where we have C sharp versus uh, C natural. Uh, that's a uh, that that's generally how my thought process uh, goes. So we have E minor, E E uh, G and B, which is our tonic triad. We then have B, D sharp, F sharp and B, which is our 5 chord, B major, passing 7th on the bass, G, E, G, and B, that's a 1-6 chord, E minor in first inversion, passing tone on the bass, and then we have E, B, F sharp, and B. This is like a tonic triad in, oh, you know what? Mm, I'm going to walk that back and actually say that, you know, you could look at this F sharp as like a, uh, as a 4-3, or sorry, a 9-8 suspension over the bass. But I'm going to say this E is an accented non-chord tone. This is actually D-sharp, B, F-sharp, and B, which is just taking our 5 chord and putting it in first inversion, where we then resolve not to an E minor chord, almost to an E minor chord, but actually where we're resolving to, I'm going to have to get rid of that secondary analysis just because it uh, uh, gets in the way here. But instead of going to an E minor chord, where it's going to take us to is actually C major over E. And that mainly has to do with the way that the resolution uh, just completes. So this F sharp here, E, B, F sharp, and G kind of looks like an E minor chord that would resolve um, uh, where this F sharp is a 9-8 suspension. But with the tenor also changing to a C, I think this turns into a 6-6 six, six chord. And the reason why I'm convinced that it turns into a 6-6 six, six chord is because I think this is where we modulate to the key of A minor, and this becomes 3-6. It's relatively uncommon. I'd say um, 3 is one of the lesser used chords for common chord modulation, but usually the context that we see 3 being used is either before 4 or 7, and the next chord we get is actually a 4 chord, so Bach just turns that into an ascending series of adjacent chords, so 3, 4, 5, or I'm not 3, just 3 going to 4 is a relatively common progression where 3 is one of the chords. So 3, 6 takes us to F sharp, C, 
E and A. You could call this a um, 2 7 chord, right? An F sharp minor 7 flat 5. Uh, but I think this E is a 7 6 suspension over the bass, and we're getting sort of a double suspension figure where one is not going down, but it's actually going up. And I know that there's a term for a suspension that resolves upwards, not downwards. It's just eluding me right now. So I think this is actually a 4 6 chord, D major over F sharp, and this is just melodic minor. We've seen it a couple of times in this chorale. Uh, so this isn't a secondary dominant or anything, it's just a harmonization of the melodic minor scale. Uh, D is a chord tone, C is a passing seventh, and then we have G sharp, B, D, and B. Um, I mean, I would be inclined to say that this D is also sort of functioning like a suspension, but uh, whether you call this 5, 6, or seven in root position, I'm inclined to say that it's seven in root position, just because the length of the um, the fact that D is held longer than E it really sort of makes E feel more like a uh, an anticipation more so than it is the root of the chord. But I think analyzing this as five six makes total sense to this A being a neighboring seventh, regardless of how you look at it, or not a neighboring seventh, sorry, a neighbor tone. Um, it really just depends on how you look at the chord. Um, yeah, 5, 6 versus 7. For me, 4, 6 going to 7 makes a ton of sense because 4 wants to go to 7, but we also see 4 going to 5. I'd say in cadential situations, it's much more common to see 4 go to 7 than it is for 4 to go to 5, even though there's no reason why 4 in theory couldn't go to 5. It's just box idiosyncrasies, it's just based on how he writes. It's not a, it, it's just a matter of fact. Um, but then we, regardless, cadence on uh, A minor, A, uh, a, E, and that same C, tonic, triad, root position. We get a similar sort of cadential structure here where we visit the key of E minor and then we loop back to the key of A minor by the end of the phrase. We start off with, again, just to sort of be consistent with the way that Bach gets to the key of E minor, I'm going to call this A, a four chord, and then we're going to move to E minor, E, G, E, and B tonic triad root position, like a plagal, prog uh, plagal progression, sort of just approaching the E from the other direction. And then we have a descending chromatic bass line, E, uh, D sharp, and D natural. And it's pretty cool how Bach goes about doing this. And this phrase actually poses a bit of a, kind of an interesting analytical conundrum, but I don't think it was too hard to figure out. It was just interesting again seeing another minor dominant uh, but i'll talk about it when we get to it so after our tonic triad we have d sharp b f sharp and b that's just b major over d sharp our five six chord with a passing tone in the uh, alto and this a is also a non chord tone it's the chordal seventh uh, and then we have d e a and B, this A being a kind of interesting A5-4 suspension. We've been seeing those recently. It's kind of interesting to see that, uh, but really what this chord is implying is E7 over D, which is a secondary dominant, 5-4-2 of 4, because when we take a tonic triad and uh, make it major in the key, in a minor key like E minor, for example, it very clearly turns into the dominant of the subdominant, and that's where it resolves to A minor like we would expect it to. C, E, uh, A, and C, which is A minor in first inversion, and I do think this is where we modulate to the key of A minor. Four becomes our tonic, sort of the same in the same in and the same out sort of situation. Bach does this from time to time. Um, but we have sort of a bit of a modulation zone here. You could say that the modulation occurs over the E minor chord as well. It doesn't really make too much sense to me, just because modulating over a minor dominant isn't really something that we see happen all that often in Bach. But then again, if you have a different relationship with the harmony and don't see um, any issue with that in terms of like, you know, it, it, it being something that can take place in Bach's writing, um, yeah, go for it. I think that that's a totally valid analysis, and it can be backed up with the fact that we've seen A minor go to E minor in the past. Um, but I'm using that same argument to say that we have a one progression here going to E, E, A, and B, where this A is a 4-3 suspension over the bass, and we see a very similar 
spelling to what we had in the A section where we have this E turning into a D here over these, uh, this dotted eighth note and sixteenth note. And instead of writing it this way, um, it's written as a dotted quarter note going into an eighth note rather than two separate note values. So really that's what made me feel like the modulation happened here because this just looks like a, a, a slight variation. Only real thing that's changing here is the, um, the bass. Uh, but this looks uh, pretty much identical to what's happening in the A section. Uh, but this D is a very brief passing seventh. And then we get uh, five going to six, F, C, G, and A. Um, I guess you could make an argument, I'm going to call it six, but you could make an argument that it is six, four, two as well, because by the time we get the resolution, um, we have E in the bass. Um, I'm going to say that that's not really part of it just because I feel like when we're in a cadential situation, Bach tends to be as contrapuntal as he usually gets in the overall texture. Um, and I think really the big picture here is the six going to the four. And really with this F in the bass, I feel like the F is really the key um, contributor to the bass here because this is a um, not just a half cadence but a Phrygian half cadence and if you've watched any of my videos in the past where I talk about Phrygian half cadences in the Bach chorales sorry if you can hear the engines in the background I live next to a busy street but um, what ends up happening is uh, typically we precede the five chord with a four six chord and even though there are other chords that can be taken from the texture really what this G sort of feels like is more like a nine eight suspension over the bass and the bass then changes and then by the time we finally get the resolution we have our four six chord which I do believe this B is an accented non chord tone and it's really this A that is our uh, chord tone here F A D and A. Of course, if you look at this B as our chord tone, you can call this a 2 4 3 chord because I would make this a B minor 7 flat 5 chord over F. And 6 would want to go to 2, so that's a very valid argument as well. I'm just using my past experience with uh, um, Phrygian, cad Phrygian half cadences in Bach to um, guide where I go. Um, but all in all, 4 6 versus 2 4 3. It's fairly negligible. I honestly wouldn't have any problem just calling this entire section um, a 4-6 chord because I see all of the instability and the movement that's eventually leading to the D minor chord in my opinion. So this whole phrase could be, or this whole measure up until the cadence could be a 4-6 chord, but uh, you know, I, I think there is a little bit more variety than that uh, when it comes down to, the, to, to, to what's really happening here. But all in all, it does cadence on five. It is a half cadence E, uh, B, E, and G sharp. E major in root position. And we stay in A minor for the rest of the chorale. We end in a perfect authentic cadence. And we get sort of a phrase that evokes a similar motion to the beginning of the B section. We have E, B, E, and G sharp, which is still our five chord. No need to reanalyze. Passing seventh in the bass, C, C, E, and A. It's A minor in first inversion. Passing tone in the bass, A, B, E, and B. Again, very similar progression to the beginning of the B section. We have G sharp, B, E, and B, which is our five chord in first inversion, E major over G sharp, and then resolves to A minor, A, A, E, and C tonic triad root position. A is a chord tone, G sharp's a little neighbor tone here, and then we have F, A, A, and D. That's D minor over F, which is 4, 6. D is a chord tone, and F is a chord tone that sort of briefly takes our chord and puts it in root position. And then we have E, E, uh, A, and B. This A is a 4-3 suspension over the bass. The same way that we get a lot of 9-8 suspensions over tonic triads, we get a lot of 4-3 suspensions over dominant chords, just something that Bach does. G sharp is a chord tone, F sharp is a non-chord tone, B is a chord tone as well. And then we have E, E, G sharp, and B, that's sort of the, 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 um, the resolution to the suspension here that's uh, implying the 5 chord. We then have a passing 7th in the tenor, and then we cadence on 
A major, A, C sharp, uh, E, and A, which is our tonic triad. With a Picardy third, Bach often ends his minor chorales with a major tonic triad. Um, I expect it has to do more with major chords, just the relationship he has with major chords. Maybe it's to end on a more uplifting note. That's what I used to think, but I think now it has more so to do with the fact that major kind of has a stronger... Uh, he has he has a relationship with major chords in the sense that they just have a stronger resolute quality um, and that is today's analysis a couple of takeaways are the minor dominance um, relatively uncommon to see these when they pop up in the chorale really with um, nothing really veiling them they're just there in the open that's pretty cool we have mid phrase modulations right a ton of them we have uh, E minor to A minor E minor to A minor, well, maybe not a ton of them. That's kind of a, that's kind of an exaggeration. Uh, we also have A minor to, to D minor as well. So three of the phrases, three of the, um, I guess, five, well, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, three of the five. So the majority of them have a um, mid phrase modulation. That's pretty interesting. And also a descending chromatic uh, bass line. It's pretty interesting that it's descending. Ascending chromatic bass lines can be interesting too, but descending chromatic bass lines are particularly interesting because uh, generally tonal music wants to go up. Like when you look at a leading tone, it's called the leading tone because it wants to go up. That's just the narrative function that the the tone has. And when it goes down, you can see that you know it would spell a non-normative chord progression, right? One going to five, six. And then if we just look at the secondary dominant as a um, like an intermediary chord, we would have a five, six to four, six progression, which is relatively uncommon. Adjacent chords, like in this case, five to four, are um, usually see them going in the other direction. Uh, well, I've been calling transitive chord progressions where we have a chord that goes against the grain. It's much more common to seek roots that are a fourth apart rather than roots that are a second apart move that way, especially when they are in the same inversion. Um, in this case, they're in first inversion, which isn't like, you know, uh, the most interesting. If they were in root position, that would be really interesting, like the most interesting, but it's still, uh, yeah, it's still something worth talking about. Uh, but other than that, I think that's pretty much all this chorale has to, um, well, I don't want to say it, all that it has to offer, but that's uh, really all of the takeaways that make this chorale uh, sort of unique things that I look for. Uh, but there very, well be more, there very well might be more interesting facts about this chorale that just weren't on my radar. Um, if you're interested in following me along on the journey to analyze all of Bach's chorale harmonizations, uh, feel free to subscribe to the channel. You can hit the notification icon as well and like the video if you enjoyed the content. Thank you so much for watching the video and supporting the channel by doing so. I look forward to tomorrow's analysis and I hope you take care.